minute mark. Uh, this is a straight punchline. Um, basically, here are complicated. And we all know that Kia are clever, and we all, anybody who's had any interaction with Kia knows that they're clever. But actually, they're, they're quite complicated in ways that we might not necessarily um, think about naturally. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about their foraging work, or their foraging behavior. And it's based on, on the work of two students, Laura, or ex-students, I should say, Laura <laughs> Young was one of them. Uh, and they did exceptional field work throughout quite a range of the uh, New Zealand, or of the South Island Kia habitat. So, the first thing that I want to get across is that they're very polyphagous, so they eat a huge variety of plants, as well as insects, wood, you name it. Um, but they also have, just note the snow totara here, the Podocarpus um, nivalis, they seem to have a bit of a preference for that particular species. But they do eat basically anything. They'll eat the flowers, they'll eat the fruit, they'll eat the wood, they'll eat all sorts of um, Foods. And of course, unfortunately, just <coughs> foods as well. So I want to really concentrate now on the fruit eating. So um, the interesting thing about here is they actually really, really like to eat fruit, and particularly, as you'll note later on, the alpine here. So this is based um, primarily on observations over a couple of seasons by Laura Young. And she observed all instances of animals, or birds in fact, eating fruit. And she found that 95% of the 217 instances were done by Kia. And this is highly relevant. Why? Oh, next slide. Um, but it is highly relevant. But one thing, of course, that might not be surprising is that there is some seasonal variation in terms of what they're eating. So of course, it's not fruiting year-round. So what we find is that in the spring and in the winter, they tend to eat less fruit and they tend to eat more leaves, leaves buds, uh, leaf buds, a little bit more uh, woody material. Whereas in the summer and in the autumn, they're primarily um, eating uh, fruit. But this is all with the alpine kia, just I want to note that, because I'm going to be talking about geographic variation soon. Uh, fecal analysis confirms this, so this is when you basically dig into their poo and explore what's inside there. It's a very nice job that Laura can tell you all about, um, and Amanda, another student of mine. What I really want to point out here is that here in the spring, we get a huge peak in invertebrate um, foraging. So that basically the kia are switching in the spring when they're not eating a whole lot of um, fruit, which they do throughout the summer and the autumn, um, they're actually switching to invertebrates. So they're, they're eating insects, they're probably rooting around for grubs, so they're probably rooting around uh, in the ground or in bark uh, for, for insects. So that actually changes slightly the trophic level. So they're actually eating more protein in this um, spring period. And of course one of the questions that remains is how they're provisioning their chicks because of course their chicks are, are inside basically throughout the, the end of the winter and they've got to provision their chicks with quite a lot of food and, and give them enough nutritious food for them to be able to well, hopefully survive as well. Um, so, so the question remains, how do they actually get the types of foods that they get and how do they provision those nests and do they do that in the same way depending on the habitat in which they live? So I talked about fruit before. Why is fruit eating so important? Well, in New Zealand about 14% of our land mass is alpine and we can think of alpine areas as essentially like, uh, like islands. They're fragmented areas divided by sometimes very large valleys. So if you're a plant, and you need to genetically mix um, to, to be able to maintain um, to be able to maintain some sort of basically genetically healthy population. You need to be able to be dispersed. You need to have your seeds dispersed from one, let's say, mountainous area to another mountainous area, which might be a very large valley away. So you need some sort of long distance disperser. And a lizard probably won't cut it, um, and a wetter will cut it even less, right? So what do we have in terms of options in New Zealand, at least native options in New Zealand? Well, kia are um, one of the most likely options, particularly for our alpine plants. And our alpine plants are actually very, very, it's very common to see fruit, unusually common. About 12% of the alpine plants in this country um, produce fruit itself. So can those alpine plants be dispersed from one mountainous region to another mountainous region across the valley. So when we think about this, we can actually obviously consider birds as a, as a logical disperser, which is going to be important for that genetic mixing. 
And birds can be considered seed predators or seed dispersers. So seed predators, you'd expect a kia to be a seed predator. I mean, if you just take one look at that beak, anybody's been nibbled by a kia, you'd think that a seed wouldn't survive. Um, so, so birds that crush seeds and break them up are called seed predators. Eventually, I mean, those seeds, even if they are excreted, they'll be, they'll be destroyed. So they won't germ the, the plants won't germinate. Whereas seeds that are swallowed whole and then excreted somewhere else, intact, can potentially germinate in a different area. So those would be seed dispersers. Parrots are not famous for being seed dispersers. They're famous, in fact, for being seed predators. So the question here is, well, if the key are seed predators, what have we got left? Because, of course, most of the birds that might have been seed dispersers in New Zealand are now extinct. We do know that kia fly long distances. They might not, but sometimes they do. So the question is, are kia, like all other parrots around the world, seed predators? So Laura, again, um, spent a lot of time actually in Cambridge in the UK, ironically, um, analyzing um, or looking into a hell of a lot of kia poo. And she um, collected more than 8,000 seeds, 95% of which were intact, okay? So this suggests that actually they have the potential to be dispersed. For some reason, they're very delicate. And actually, if you think about a kia, if, it, if you have actually had one nibble on you, um, they can be very gentle. So, in fact, it seems like maybe they're quite gentle with these seeds. But even though they fly long distances, and even though they actually do excrete um, intact kia, I mean in intact seeds, <coughs> not intact kia, um, <laughs> um, You've still got to have something else. You have to have those seeds inside the animal for long enough that it might have traveled a long distance. I mean, if it just swallows a seed and then it poos it straight out, like a lot of us might do with coffee, um, <laughs> then, uh, then you don't have any potential for dispersal, do you? So you need to have a passage time that's quite long. So this is where blueberries come in handy. So you feed blueberries at uh, Willow Bank, at the Kia Willow Bank, um, because they have the, the nice effect of, of making very blue poo, so you can actually track the poo. Um, and so Laura again has a very um, pleasurable experience of tracking kia poo uh, and seeing how long it took for them to excrete this. And it actually took, a, on average, about 140 minutes, so over two hours. So if you can imagine, of course, a kia has a very good chance of having traveled quite some distance over that, that period. So are alpha, uh, kia alpine seed dispersers or plant dispersers? The answer is yes. And actually, interestingly, it's the only known carrot globally that is able to do this. So we might think that they eat carrots, but they're very, very gentle animals, really. <laughs> so um, I said they're complicated. Now, one of the things that I want to point out is that actually there seem to be some important geographic differences in terms of what they eat. I've already mentioned that they have this little thing about Podocarpus nivalis and Snotopra. Um, these are observations in red tons down, down near Mount Cook and Sugarloaf just by Cass. And what I want you to really look at is just in this area here. So they really like Snotopra, yeah, that's just a given. But actually, depending on the geographic location, they seem to spend quite a different amount of time foraging on berries in the different areas. And this is probably not necessarily skewed in terms of the fact that, for example, down south, the berries might come in a little bit later because this has taken over quite some number of weeks over two different seasons. So there seem to be some geographical differences in terms of what they eat. Perhaps learned, we don't know. Now, we've already talked, I've just mentioned geographical differences, but these are all alpine here. But everybody always talks about the only, world's only mountain parrot, blah, blah, blah. But actually, of course, kia are found at lowland levels. I'm going to call those rainforests here. And so they're found at lowland levels in various places. Fox was one of our uh, study sites, Fox and Ocadillo. Uh, and so the rainforest kia that I'm talking about are those. And what we find is that actually there are quite some significant differences, in fact, in terms of what they're eating, and this is based on um, fecal sample analysis, uh, depending on the habitat. So, for example, we've got the alpine here and the white. The alpine kia tend to eat a lot more fruity material than the uh, rainforest kia, but the rainforest kia, importantly, eat a lot more invertebrates than the alpine kia. Now, this is based on fecal, um, fecal samples and analysis of fecal samples, but which can be a little bit problematic. But we also confirm that with um, blood and feathers, which measure different sort of um, 
periods of time. But we measured that uh, using stable isotope analysis of, of blood and feathers, and this is confirmed that way. So the summary is that Kia are in fact the dominant disperser of, um, of alpine fruiting plants, which makes them important for all of our, our, our flora, basically, for the alpine systems. Um, and I also want to point out that there are differences in terms of the trophic niche, in terms of the amount of protein, if you like, that is being um, eaten by the rainforest, the lowland kia and the alpine <coughs> kia. And I didn't have time to talk about the fact that they may even have some segregation. So although we know that the kia do move between, for example, Fox and Ocarito and up here, there seems to be a segregation in the resource use by the kia down there and up here. Um, so we've got more, uh, more nitrogen or more protein, if you like, more animal consumption in the lowland kia, more fruit consumption in the alpine kia, which we can detect by the nitrogen levels that are, um, that are measured in the stable isotope analysis. But also males seem to be predominantly driving that. So it's the males in the um, lowland areas that are particularly seem to be eating the insects. Now, one of the ways they collect insects, if anybody can visualize a cow stripping a tree, is that they root around and they dig into the bark, and they use those big, long, hooked beaks, and they're sexually dimorphic in those beaks. So the males have got longer beaks than the females. And the rainforest um, kia seem to have longer beaks than the alpine kia. Um, and the male rainforest kia have unusually long beaks, it would appear. So it's possible that this is some sort of local adaptation. We haven't actually published this yet. So just to, to finish up, um, I wanted to just talk about a completely different thing about their complexity. Uh, so we're not talking about foraging, but still how complex they are. So Kia, we've discovered, we also work on their communication. We found that they've got at least seven distinct uh, calls, and some of those calls are associated with certain types of behaviors. Uh, warble, what we call the play call, is a call that's associated almost exclusively with play, and anybody who's for any time of Kia knows that they play. And it sounds like this. <laughs> um, which made everybody laugh. <laughs> In fact, the media just now had a blitz about how this is the laugh call. It doesn't sound, and somebody asked me, does it sound like a laugh? And I'm like, mm. uh, not at all. But we did some playback experiments in which we um, played a, was it a South Island Robin? Or a tomtit, I can't remember. Uh, a screech call, which is another Kia call. It's the usual Kia call, in fact, the Kia call. Just a, a, a white noise. Uh, warble, this is the play call. And a whistle, which is a different type of Kia call. And we played that, well, we had a five minute pre playback period, a five minute during playback period where we played these calls, and five minutes afterwards, and we just measured the behavior. And with a warble call alone during the playback, uh, they increased both the length and number of play bouts. And in fact, if they were by themselves, they would just start playing by themselves, just jumping around. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is what it looks like. <laughs> guaranteed, guaranteed fun for all. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'd just like to um, acknowledge the work, hard work done by my students. I'm taking all the credit here. It's actually the students have done all this work. And um, thank you all.